Lieutenant Barton recording, sir. Oh, yes, Barton. Glad to see you. I understand you're here to fly away a Curtis P. party. That's right, Mr. Collins. Is this the one? That's it. It's all yours. It's a fine airplane. I've just been giving it a workout. I suppose you're anxious to go over the instruments and controls and really get acquainted with the P-40, huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Aren't we going to use this one? My Curtis P-40? No, we'll use that plane over there on the deck. I never got anywhere on a pair of jacks. Well, we're up and on deck, Barton. <laughs> the airs will turn up later in the final showdown. <laughs> you see, Lieutenant, with the plane on jacks, you can operate the landing gear and get used to the controls before taking the ship off the ground. I might as well hook up my parachute and safety belt, I guess, so I'll feel at home. That's right. It'll help you get familiar with the cockpit. We recommend the use of these shoulder straps. They'll keep you from being thrown against the instrument panel in case of a mishap. We've found that the best way to learn the P-40 is to study one system at a time. So let's start in with the fuel system. Here's the fuel selector valve down here at your left. Yes, sir. I see it's labeled with the capacity for each tank. Yeah, and when you set it in position, you'll feel a positive click. Well, Mr. Collins, is there any certain order for drawing fuel from the different tanks? Yes, there is. For taxi and takeoff, we recommend the fuselage tank because it's higher and the fuel flows with more of a gravity head. Also, as the fuel is used up, the airplane's center of gravity moves forward. This causes the plane to become more stable and makes it a better gun platform. This gauge on the instrument panel shows the amount of fuel in the fuselage tank. Of course, if you're flying a plane with the belly tank at that, you should start using that tank as soon as you've climbed a bit. Then, if you get in a fight, you won't waste any fuel. When you pull this release and drop the belly tank from the plane, When the fuselage tank and the belly tank are empty, switch to the rear wing tank. The gauge is on the left side of the cockpit floor. I see. Then you save the front wing tank until last. That's right. Uh-huh. Is there any sort of a signal when your fuel runs low? Yes. Normal fuel pressure is between 15 and 16 pounds. And when any tank begins to run dry, well, of course, your fuel pressure drops. And a warning light flashes on in time for you to turn to another tank. On the lower left side of the instrument panel is the switch for the electric fuel pump. It's a good idea to keep the fuel pump on all during flight, so you won't forget to turn it on when you need it at high altitude. The cooling system of the P-40 is regulated by the cowl flap, and these flaps should be open whenever you taxi, take off, or climb. In most P-40s, the flaps are controlled by a manually operated lever on the right side of the cockpit. But in some of the P-40Fs, the cowl flaps are controlled by an electric switch. You put the switch up for automatic operation. If the automatic feature fails, can I still operate the flaps? Yes. You can put the toggle switch down and hold it to the left to open the flap, or down and to the right to close it. Well, Mr. Collins, of course I know the cowl flaps regulate the temperature of the oil and coolant, but what temperature should I try to maintain? Normal oil temperature is between 40 and 90 degrees centigrade. Coolant temperature is between 85 and 125 degrees centigrade. 
Now, if the coolant reaches 125, a light warns you to open the cowl flaps and cool the engine down. Of course, you never take off with the coolant temperature above 125 degrees. The landing gear and wing flaps of the P-40 are raised and lowered by means of hydraulic pressure. This is the flap control right here. To lower the flap, you push the control handle forward and pull the lower trigger on the control stick. Don't get mixed up and pull the gun trigger by mistake. The flap should never be lowered when your air speed is above 140 miles an hour. At higher speeds, you might damage them by trying to put them down. The plane also becomes too nose-heavy. Are the flaps automatically locked in position? Not until you move the control back to neutral, like this. I see. And I suppose the flaps up position is back here. Yeah, pardon, that's right. To raise the flaps, you move the control back and pull the trigger on the stick. The flaps go up pretty fast, so don't try to raise them at slow air speeds when your altitude is below 500 feet. At air speeds less than 110 miles an hour, the plane will mush down if you raise the flaps. So if you overshoot the field, Gun the engine and climb back up to 500 feet before you put the flaps up. The landing gear control lever is here on your left. To raise the gear, push this pin forward and lift the handle. But don't do it while the plane's resting on its wheel. That would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Yeah, but one of my fellows did it the other day. Was he hurt? No. He got away before I could catch him. <laughs> but you're all right as long as the plane's on deck. So uh, go ahead and raise the gear. How soon after the takeoff did the gear be retracted? Just as soon as you clear the field. Watch the indicator, and when it shows that the gear is up, check the position by operating the hand pump. must be stuck. I can hardly move it. When the pump is solid, the landing gear is locked in retracted position. Now put the control back in neutral. That locks the hydraulic fluid in the retracting system. Before you lower the gear, be sure to reduce your air speed below 175 miles per hour. The hydraulic mechanism is not designed to force the gear down against the higher air speed. Then push the control handle down. That's it. Now pull the trigger on the stick. That starts the gear down. Before the gear gets all the way down, retard the throttle. All the way back? Yep. So the warning horn will flow until the gear is down and locked. Then when the horn stops, the gear is safely down, as shown on the indicator. That's right, Barton. It's always a good idea to check the hand pump. Then lock the system by putting the lever back to neutral. All T-40s up to the L model have an emergency hydraulic system. Now to operate the emergency system, unlock the catch at the bottom of the hydraulic hand pump handle. Put the handle on the emergency pump. And open these two red emergency valves. Don't open them now because the main system's on. But if the main system is shot away, you can get the wheels down by operating the emergency pump. Now you'll have to land without the tail wheel or the flaps, because the emergency system operates only the main wheel. The brakes are on a separate system, so they'll be okay. Now, maybe I'd better explain the throttle quadrant. Tighten this knob just enough to keep the controls from creeping. Are the P-40 controls different from any others? Yes, the operation's a little different. Take the mixture control, for instance. Now, you'll notice that there are several settings. Full rich is for emergency use. 
If the automatic mixture control should fail, you'll probably never have to use it. Auto Rich is for all high power operations, take off, climb, and combat. Manual is for long distance economical cruising. Auto Lean is an automatic setting for economical operation at lower power, below 2300 RPM, and 30 inches of manifold pressure. And idle cutoff, of course, is for use when stopping and starting the engine. The mixture control is clear enough, but what are these two controls? Well, they operate the automatic boost control and the two-speed supercharger on the Packard-built Rolls-Royce engine. The boost control automatically provides takeoff power with the throttle full open and the boost control handle up in this position. And at retarded throttle position, the boost keeps the manifold pressure constant. When do you turn the boost control off? The only reason for turning the boost control off, like this, would be if the automatic feature should fail. With the boost control off, don't open the throttle too wide or you'll get too much manifold pressure. Yes, I know better than to take too much manifold pressure with a low RPM. That would make the engine knock. That's right, Barton. And engines have been known to blow up when allowed to detonate or knock for only a few seconds. You should always raise the RPM first, then bring up the manifold pressure. And to cut the power down, reverse the procedure. Okay, I think I understand the operation of the boost control, but what about the two-speed supercharger? When do you switch to the high position? Move it to high when you reach an altitude of 13,000 feet. But first you retard the throttle slightly. Otherwise, the high supercharger might build up too much manifold pressure. Now, move the supercharger control up fast. That's right. And then open the throttle again to get the desired climbing manifold pressure. All P-40s are equipped with Curtis electric propellers, and you should know how they work. These two switches on the instrument panel operate the propeller. The left switch is a circuit breaker and should always be on. The right switch controls the pitch of the blade. Now, when it's in automatic, you can use the propeller governor lever to select any RPM you want. With the switch in manual, the blades are fully locked, like a fixed pitch propeller. Can you change the pitch of the blades? Sure you can. To increase the RPM, hold the switch down and to the right. To decrease the RPM, hold the switch down and to the left. What pitch do you use for takeoff? Always take off in the automatic position with the governor control lever full forward for 3,000 RPM or emergency military power. The governor will hold the RPM constant at 3,000. Open the throttle to full takeoff power to the stop with an Allison engine and pass the stop in the case of the Rolls-Royce engine when the automatic boost control is on. Then after takeoff, you reduce the power. About this much? Yeah, retard the throttle to approximately 35 inches of manifold pressure. And pull the propeller governor control back to the desired RPM position. Was the switch still in automatic? Yes, you leave it in automatic for normal flight, but for long cruising, put it on manual and lean out the mixture just as you would with a fixed pitch propeller. Green marks on the tachometer and manifold pressure gauge 
show the maximum power condition which can be held for continuous operation. Have the mixture at auto-rich with the normal power condition. For long-range cruising, reduce the power below 2280 RPM and 30 inches of manifold pressure. Auto-lean mixture setting may be used at this low power. Well, how about it now, Barton? Are you all set on the propeller? Yes, I think so. What's next? Suppose we go through the operations of starting the engine. And you make the settings as I call them off. Right. Mixture at idle cutoff. Throttle, one inch open. Fuel on fuselage tank. Carburetor air, full cold. This prevents possible backfiring into the engine compartment during starting. Battery switch on. Generator switch on. Fuel pump on. Three right-hand circuit breakers on. Gun switches off. Now check your fuel pressure. Fifteen and a half pounds. Okay, then prime the engine. How much do I give it? One stroke for a warm engine, three if the engine's cold. Then shut off the fuel pump. Shut it off? Yeah, to keep from flooding the engine when you move the mixture control forward. All right. Now the next thing would be to turn the ignition to both and engage the starter. But we won't do that while the plane's on jack. After the engine fires, advance the mixture control to auto rip and the throttle to 1,200 RPM. Then turn the fuel pump back on. If there's no oil pressure within 15 to 30 seconds, stop the engine and investigate the trouble. If the oil pressure's okay, 60 to 80 pounds, Warm up the engine at 12 to 1400 RPM until the oil temperature hits 40. And the pressed temperature at least 85 degrees centigrade. During cold weather, leave the cowl flaps closed until the engine is warmed up. With the propeller switch on manual, run the engine up to 2300 RPM and check the magnetos. A drop of more than 100 RPM on a single magnetos indicate faulty ignition. If the magnetos are okay, then switch the propeller back to automatic. Release the parking brake and taxi to the runway. The tailwheel is steerable by the rudder pedals, so don't ride the brakes when you taxi. Now when you get to the runway, just before you take off, make a final check of everything. Fuel selector valve on the fuselage tank. Fuselage period showing plenty of fuel. Fuel pressure 15 to 16 pounds. Oil temperature above 40 degrees. Oil pressure 60 to 80 pounds. Coolant temperature above 85. Right hand circuit breakers on. Gun switches off. Battery on, generator on, propeller on automatic, propeller circuit breaker on, mixture on auto rich, propeller governor in full forward position, automatic boost on, supercharger in low speed, elevator trim tabs at TO. Takeoff position. Rudder trim tab at one and a half marks to the right. Aileron trim tab neutral. Cow flat open, and you're all set to go. 
Over there on the runway is Lloyd Child, chief test pilot for Curtis Wright. He's going to put that ship through some maneuvers for us. And as he does, I'll try to give you some pointers on handling the P-40 in the air. Okay? I'm all set. All right. As the plane starts down the runway, open the throttle with a positive, steady motion. That's it. And still with the brakes at first. Then use the rudder to steer when you get the tail in the air. Engine torque pulls the left wing down. So keep the wings level by holding the stick to the right. Fly the plane off the ground by lowering the tail just a little at the takeoff. Then you don't take off in a three-point attitude? No, because that might put the airplane in a stalled condition, which would be bad at your slow speed right after takeoff. You see, engine failure or a gust of wind when you're stalled so close to the ground could be disastrous. And just as soon as you clear the field, retract the landing gear and retard the throttle and propeller control to normal flying power. Pick up speed as soon as possible, and climb at 140 miles an hour. Now to gain altitude fast, you can climb at full military power for 15 minutes with the Rolls Royce, and five minutes with the Allison. These settings are marked with yellow lines on the instrument. The P-40 is normal in all flight characteristics, as you'll see when Lloyd goes through his maneuvers. But I've heard that some new pilots tend to over-control because they're not used to the long nose of the liquid-cooled engine ahead of them. Slight changes in the heading of the airplane with respect to the horizons appear to be more than they would with radial engine airplanes. However, after a few minutes of flying, I'm sure you'll be able to do it smoothly and easily without fighting the controls. Stalling speed of the P-40 is 82 with the slaps down and 92 with the flaps up. Just before the stall, there's a slight tail buffet to warn the pilot. And the stall, if allowed to continue, throws the plane in a spin that loses a thousand feet a turn. Now the P-40 will come out of the spin by itself if the pilot lets go of the controls. But to come out in a hurry, cut the throttle, kick the rudder in the opposite direction to the spin, and shove the control stick forward. Well, I'm glad to know the plane will straighten out by itself. But if I get in a spin, brother, I want to do something about it. Now let's see now. To come out in a hurry, I cut the throttle, kick the rudder hard in the direction opposite to the spin, and shove the control stick forward. Okay, Lieutenant. That'll take you out of the spins in a hurry. But when you start flying a pursuit airplane, 
The main thing you've got to learn is the right way to land it. As Lloyd comes in, I'll point out a few things for you to remember when landing occurred at speed 40. And the first thing to do is to cut your airspeed to less than 175 miles an hour while you're up around 3,500 feet. Get your landing gear down while you still have plenty of altitude. Last-minute operations and maneuvers are apt to upset your good landing technique. Circle the field at approximately 140 miles an hour. To get accustomed to the slower airspeed and to familiarize yourself with the field and get set for the landing. What items do you check off before landing? They're all listed on this checkoff card. The first thing to do, though, is open the cabin. In fact, most every old-timer will tell you he can set the airspeed better when he feels the breeze in his face. And it's safer to have the cabin open if you hit a ditch and end up on your back. If you ever happen to end up with the airplane on its back and the cabin closed, you can open the kick-out panel in the left-hand side of the sliding hood by means of this red lever near the lingerie. There's another emergency exit you can use during flight. Up here in the top of the cabin roof is a red lever. Simply pull this lever and it'll release the whole cabin. Then you check to make sure the mixture control is on auto rich and the propeller governor control at 2650 automatic settings. It's a good idea to have the propeller set this way for plenty of RPM in case you have to give her the gun and go around again. On the other hand, you should not set it for full 3,000 RPM because it might momentarily over-rev if you open the throttle too fast. Of course, the fuel selector should be on a tank with plenty of gas. The carburetor heat control full forward and the gun switches off. And test the hand pump again just to make sure the landing gear is down before you put the landing gear in neutral. While you're still high up, put your flaps about halfway down, make a wide sweep, and glide toward the runway at 115 miles an hour. Trim the elevator tab so the plane will glide hands off at this speed. Line up with the runway while you're still a mile away. This will prevent last-minute maneuvers which sometimes cause ground loops. New pilots have a tendency to undershoot the field. They cut the throttle and come in short. So remember to keep the throttle slightly open when you first come in for a landing. At 500 feet above the ground, put your flat full down, cut the throttle to one half inch open, and glide in at 115 miles an hour until you're over the runway. When you're 10 feet off the ground, cut the throttle and level out for the landing. When all the wheels are down in the three-point attitude, apply the brakes fairly hard but not hard enough to lock the wheels or raise the tail. Remember, most landing accidents happen after the plane is on the runway. So concentrate on rolling straight until the plane comes to a stop. I can understand that all right. Well then, Lieutenant, I guess you've got it. Is that really all there is to fly with Curtis C-40? Doesn't seem at all complicated now. Well, there's nothing complicated or difficult about flying this airplane. Once you understand the things we've carefully gone over, I don't remember to take it easy. In fact, they tell me a walk, like that one over there, is apt to take off by itself if it's left alone too long. I got you, Dick. <laughs> I'm practically in the air right now. I'm going to go to the hospital. 
On that landing, you look like a veteran. Oh, thank you, sir. Getting fond of this airplane already. Okay, Lieutenant. Then you're all set. So long, fella. Lots of luck. Thanks. Hadn't I better wait for those two P-40s to come in? No, that's just a couple of the boys waiting to give you a send-off. Clear on up to join them. With men like these, flying planes like these, there'll always be a flag like this, waving in the breeze, a symbol of freedom, decency, and democracy to all the world. that plane, climbing to heaven like a skyrocket? Heaven was the wrong destination for that baby. That's a zero, a real McCoy. They were shot down over Alaska. And as luck would have it, the only thing that got really damaged was the pilot. He broke his neck. Swear, huh?
Think you can recognize her again? This is the Japanese Zero. Take a good look at her. Your recognition of the Zero may save your life. Your recognition of the Zero may destroy its life. Watch her closely. Study every characteristic to aid you in your recognition. Look at that nose. A perfect circle broken only by the oil cooler. Note the slight dihedral angle. Look at that low wing and middle tail. Notice the oil cooler and air scoop directly below the engine cowling. See how the fuselage tapers to a point in the rear. It's like a big cigar. Note the tapering edges of the wing, the rounded tips. See how straight the line is from engine to tail. And that tail, see how the leading edge of the vertical piece tapers more than the trailing edge. Look how it curves out to a point away from the nose. Think you can recognize her? Don't think, be sure. Watch her. Watch her closely. Yes, we know that's no zero. That's a P-40. But did you know? They don't look alike to you now, do they? Look at the difference in the shape of those noses. The P-40 with its deep radiator is oval. The zero is a perfect circle, broken only by that oil cooler. Get those undercarriage fairings on the P-40. Compare the tail. The tail of the P-40 is high. The tail of the Zero is middle. Let's look at her from below. Look at the pointed nose of the P-40 and the blunt nose of the Zero. The leading edge of the wings of the P-40 has no taper. The wings of the Zero taper back. The tail of the P-40 is notched. The tail of the Zero tapers into the fuselage, which extends beyond it. Now, let's take them in profile. The engine of the P-40 is in line. The Zero is radio. Note the deep radiator on the P-40 as compared to the shallow oil cooler and air scoop on the Zero. Next, see how the cock canopy on the P-40 is much further back from the nose than on the Zero. What's more, the canopy on the P-40 fits into the fuselage, while the canopy on the Zero sits on the fuselage. Now for the tail. The P-40s is rounded and curves in toward the nose. The Zeros is pointed and curves out away from the nose. No one could possibly mistake them for each other, could they? You think not? Well, let's see. Let's take the case of one pilot. His name was Jimmy Saunders. His story starts on the day when he was flying to a base somewhere in the Far East. Come here. Lieutenant Saunders, reporting for duty, sir. Glad to have you with us, Lieutenant. Glad to be here, Major. We can certainly use you. Sit down. Cigarette? Oh, thank you, sir. How was the flight over? Well, I made it, sir, with the help of a P-40. You like our P-40? Oh, yes, sir. It's a nice airplane. Good. Then maybe we can count on you not to shoot any of them down. Oh, I didn't have any plans along that line, sir. It's been done, you know. You mean jet pilots? I mean American pilots. Men with as much enthusiasm for the P-40 as you have. But with an unfortunate lack of ability to tell a friend from an enemy. Excuse me, sir, but how could anybody mistake a P-40 for a Zero? A great many things can happen in the excitement of preparing for combat. Too many pilots are too anxious to make sure they kill. They start shooting before they make certain what they're shooting at. It's a damn sight better to let a Zero get away than to knock down one of your own planes. 
say nothing of one of your own men. We've gone out to spare around here. Sir, I had no idea. Now, we're not broadcast. Fact. I know, but... Now, don't misunderstand me, Lieutenant. It's not a common occurrence. Most of our men know their plane. Uh, identification becomes second nature to them. There's still a doubt in their minds. They maneuver close enough to make sure. Well, of course, there is such a thing as being too cautious. Take the case of the man who drew those silhouettes. Say, that's quite a job. He had plenty of time for it. Been flat on his back for two months. Shot down while he was still maneuvering around trying to decide if the other plane was a zero or not. But he found out. If he'd known his identification, that zero might never have gotten him. Well, he learned his lesson, and to make certain that others would profit by it, he put it all down and knows. All right, let's see if you can do your wafting on the zero. Yes, sir. With or without looking. You might as well make it easy on yourself now. It'll be a lot tougher upstairs. Yes, sir. Wings. Leading edge tapers, trailing edge tapers, tips rounded, slight dihedral angle. You might add to that that there are two 20 millimeter cannons mounted one in each wing. Probably Swiss Ehrlichen guns. Yes, sir. Here's something I didn't know about, sir. Huh? Oh, yes. The wing tips can be folded so as to utilize more space in the carrier. Incidentally, the span is 39 feet 4 inches. All right, go on with the engine. Engine, radio, Mitsubishi version of our cyclone. That's right. There are twin row 14 cylinders. Now for the fuselage. Fuselage. Blunt nose with a spinner on it. Cockpit canopy sits on the fuselage. Retractable landing gear with bearing plates. Say, uh, there seems to be one gear missing, sir. Gears are operated hydraulically. As a result, the wheels retract elegantly. Mm -hmm. I guess there are a couple of things I don't know about this airplane, sir. I'm glad to hear you admit it. That's the beginning of wisdom. The wings and the fuselage are in one piece, made of pure aluminum. Now, there's another feature worth noting. The entire fuselage is flush riveted, with the result there are very few protuberances to cause wind resistance. The length is 28 feet, 5 inches. There's a pair of machine guns <coughs> mounted in grooves above the cowling. They're 7.7 .7 millimeter, and they're synchronized to fire through the propeller. I hope you don't ever get them on your tail. I'm with you there, sir. <laughs> All right, finish her up. Tail. Leading edge of flat surface tapers more than trailing edge, with the fuselage extending to a point beyond it. Leading edge of vertical piece tapers more than trailing edge. Tail is pointed, curves out away from the nose. I guess that's it, sir. Fair enough. As you probably know, there are three types of zeros. One is a single float plane without rig. All three have slightly varying characteristics. But this is the type you're most apt to tangle with, so get to know her. All of her. Yes, sir. I'll look for the ball of the rouge on our wings and fuselage. Yeah, I wouldn't depend on that if I were you. The Japs have a neat trick of painting her all sorts of colors. Sometimes even like our P-40s. Coffee? Uh, no, thanks. Well, sir, how soon do I get a chance to knock one up and down? Still enough. But don't get any idea of the zero is a pushover. With 340 miles an hour top speed, a service seating of 35,500 feet, and a normal range of 700 miles, increased by a droppable extra fuel tank. There's not much she can't do. They built her light and maneuverable, threw away the armor protection for the pilot and the self-sealing gasoline tanks. She only weighs around 200 pounds, fully loaded, and has a horsepower of over 900. And when you see the speed with which she climbs, you'll appreciate what I'm saying. There's just no use trying to dogfight a zero. That's out. Your best bet is to hit fast, either the wings or just behind the cockpit. But if you miss, don't hang her on. She is dead as all that, sir. Seeing's believing. But if I were you, I'd take my word for it. Yes, sir. Now, right here is our operation. So when you're on your own, you'll do patrol from our base here to these outlying islands. Well, the big day finally came. Saunders was on his own. Out chap hunting. Looks sort of keyed up. Wouldn't you be? Don't expect too much, Lieutenant. Not on your first day. What's up? See something? It's a plane, all right. But what sort of a plane? Friend or enemy? P-40 or zero? Well, now's the time to remember your recognition. Now, as in a deep radiator, Round tail curving in toward nose, inline engine, 
and it's a P-40. Or has that plane an oil cooler, an air scoop, pointed tail curving out away from nose, radial engine? If it has, then it's a zero. Tough to tell, compared. Maybe if you got closer. Start climbing, Saunders. Another shot at it? Okay, we won't rub it in. Oh, you've got it coming to you, not waiting to get your recognition. Wish I could apologize from here. Well, what's stopping you? Go on over there. Are you sure it was a thief 40? I'm positive, sir. After he held fire, he drew up and dipped his wings in recognition. I don't like to complain, sir, but do we have to fight our own Air Force, too? You've got good cause for complaint. I don't know who's responsible for this, but what I do... All right. Major, I want to... I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, I saw this reporting, sir. I just... Lieutenant? Well, in the air, has been telling me that he was attacked this afternoon by one of our planes. Do you, by any chance, know anything about this? Yes, sir. I'm afraid it was me. He's afraid. Well, Saunders, what have you got to say for yourself? Not much, sir. From a distance after it was a zero, then I held my fire... A little be- late on your identification, weren't you? Yes, sir. But I did... How run- far were you from the other plane when you opened fire? I'm not quite sure, sir. We'll soon find out. Have your film developed immediately. Yes, sir. Major, I want to get away, Lieutenant. Get after that film. Yes, sir. Corporal, get the projector ready. Yes, sir. How did you start firing at that dip? Hold it. Didn't you look in your sight? I thought I did, sir. You don't seem to be very sure of yourself, Lieutenant. I'm sure of one thing, Major. After I look at that airplane. It's closer now, I realize, but even at the distance you started firing, you should have been able to identify it. Look at that deep radiator, the inline engine. That cockpit canopy fits into the fuselage. The tail is round and curves in toward the nose. All right, Corporal, take it away. There's more film, sir. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but I have an appointment. You can stay and run it if you want to. Coming, Weldon. But if you don't mind, sir, I think I'll stay for a few more feet. I want to see how close I came to being wiped out. Carry on, Corporal. Now I know what a clay pigeon feels like. Say, wait a minute. That's not me. It's a zero. What? Hold it. Well, Saunders, I think I'll forego that appointment. Let's hear about this. Well, sir, following my encounter with the lieutenant here, I was flying along wondering if I should slit my throat. I felt like a candidate for the Jap Air Force. Getting time to turn for home. Not that I was homesick. I had a hunch what was in store for me, but I don't know you stalling. I was thinking, that other guy's probably back already, telling the Major how he almost got knocked down by another P-40. I was thinking what you'd tell me when I got back. Suddenly I stopped thinking. I saw something. Another plane. I tried to make her out. She was too far away. I started to climb. I had to get my recognition right this time. Go 
star-shaped fuselage, catering to point and rear. Jack, wings, post to nose. Canopy sits on fuselage. Jack, tail pointed. Curvy down. Blunt nose. Sloppy spinner. Radial engine. Oil cooler. Air scoop at bottom of nose. It's a zero. Jack. explosion and well I guess that's all sir well, that's enough oh it's low What's the matter with you Weldon oh it just occurred to me sir there but by the grace of God went on <laughs> <laughs> I see your point I don't think however that you have anything to worry about in the future at least not from Saunders he seems to have learned his lesson by a method I'd hardly recommend putting into general practice but nevertheless he's learned it thoroughly if every pilot would only realize the importance of identification and become letter perfect in the art of identification, there'd be fewer lives lost and fewer planes destroyed. Know your enemy, but also know your friend. Well, they know their friends, all right. And what's more, they know their enemy. Do you? Radial engine. Perfect circle, broken only by oil cooler. Low wing. Cockpit canopy sits on cigar-shaped fuselage. Blunt nose. Stubby spinner. Oil cooler and air scoop. Fuselage tapering to point and rear. Closeness of wings to nose. Radial engine. Canopy close to nose. Tail pointed and curving out away from nose. Remember, on your recognition of the zero, may depend your life. Know it, so you can destroy it. This is the Japanese zero. <laughs> 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 <laughs>